Spring makes it very easy to configure that definition, right? To tell it how to manage those objects and to how to create those objects. Uh, and it's all, and it only does what you tell it to do. It doesn't actually, um, it doesn't start scanning everything, and reading all the packages and classes in your in your uh, application. Once you start it up, it's opt in, right? It only does as much as you tell it to do and no more. So it can be very easy to tell it what to do, but you still have to do that, right? So one way to tell it what to do is to, to let it figure it out for itself, right? So you give it a hint that you want it to, to do a certain thing, and then it'll do it. And in this case, that means using something called component scanning. What you see here is a, is a component level class. That's something you might write, like your service. And we've annotated it with add component, right? The some corresponding definite, uh, you know, instantiation of the application context will scan the packages in which this class lives, and it'll see that annotation, that add component, and that tells Spring that you want Spring to create an instance of this my service class, and then introspect the fields, constructors, and setters on the class, and then for every place where you see at auto wired, to provide a reference or attempt to resolve a reference to that object. So this is one way where Spring can do a lot for you, but all, and, you know, and you don't have to actually, you know, you don't have to actually have to configure anything. You can just provide marker annotations to tell it that you want some help here, that you want it to intervene on your behalf. A different approach uh, is to actually use a configuration class, right? A configuration class is kind of like a component, where it's kind of like the previous example where we had add component, and in fact, it's actually a superset. So it can benefit from all the same services and all the same uh, uh, you know, use cases as the add component, except that it's also got one other good thing going for it, which is that Spring will look at any classes that have add configuration on it, and it'll look inside and find all the methods that have add bean on it. It'll proceed one by one and invoke each method in that class and take the return value of that class and register, register it with a context. So when my service, this method called my service is invoked. My service gets registered with the context and then that becomes available and managed by the Spring Framework. And then of course, just as before, you can now apply all the services that you want to. Similarly, we also use uh, another method to define a data source. And when that method gets invoked, or when, when Spring Framework sees that, it'll invoke it and then register the result with the container. So you can see here that we're actually invoking one method to get a reference to the other. It's pretty interesting. What's actually happening there is actually it's intercepting that invocation for the data source method, and the return value is not coming directly from the method. It's coming from the cached version in the application context, right? So that me those methods will only get called once by default, and you don't have to worry about invoking the same method a thousand times. It doesn't recreate a thousand data sources. Instead, it returns the one configured, already running, managed instance that's in the container, right? So it's very elegant to describe an object like this, and it's very natural, and of course it's you know type safe and Java friendly. A lot of you might have already seen uh, the XML configuration format, right? Which is which is the one we've had sort of from day one, before Java five and so on, uh, and it maps roughly one to one to the Java configuration that we just saw. And this is a very po popular option as well because a lot of people want to be able to define their classes and configure it in a single artifact you know, independent of the compiled code. So you have choices here, right? In this case, the XML stanza for the bean element, you know, it corresponds roughly to that Java configuration where we define a class and then Spring looks at the property elements and it says, okay, you've got these Java bean properties on the object and we expect you to, uh, you, you, you want a reference to a reference to a data source to be injected there. So you reference the data source bean, which is the defined below, right? And presumably you've configured a data source there. So that's it's the same two different objects in three different styles, right? And they all work the same way. They all end up the same place. The XML has another advantage to it, however, uh, which is that you can use the namespaces to turn on features across your objects in your container, right? You can use the namespaces to enable behavior across a wide collection of objects. Instead of just a one-to-one -one ma mapping of your object graph, you can actually say, okay, for all the objects in my objects graph, in my, in my container that have, you know, the, the declarative transaction annotation, you know, at transaction, 
at transactional. You can actually pick that up. You can say, I want Spring to manage that, you know, just by opting in. It's that one little line there. So that's another common use case. Another one is the XML provides uh, namespaces, just like you're seeing here. And so it can be a very natural way to describe not particularly objects, but, you know, higher level concepts like flows and integrations, right? It's a very natural use case for XML there. So uh, the nice part about this is that you've got a choice. You can use all three different styles, and indeed you're encouraged to do so because they all suit different suit use cases. One common use case might be to use XML to manage the higher level DSLs, as I talked about, and to also uh, turn on features in the container, right? So you might want to turn on declarative transaction management with that one little line there. Uh, and then in tandem, you can use the Java configuration option, the one where results from the method are cast for the container, to configure your data sources and classes that you know you don't have access to, right? You can't annotate somebody else's data source, but you can use the Java configuration mechanism to configure that bean. And then finally, for your business components, the components in your code where you just the, the structure is apparent and you know that Spring can just figure that for you, just use the annotations and let it scan those and pick it up, and it'll infer the structure of your object, right? And it'll automatically register all the different beans that we've just talked about, all these different styles all end up in the same place at runtime. They're not, they're not walled off. They can all see each other. They all end up in the same place. So I can declare a bean in XML and then inject that from Java configuration and vice versa. So each, to each style has its own benefits and merits, and it's, it's good to know that you have the choice, right? But again, it's all about what you tell Spring to manage. It doesn't, it doesn't just guess or try and stampede all over your code. Spring Framework is a great framework, uh, and because it is just idiomatic Java and, and XML, uh, it works well with a lot of tools, right? So you can use NetBeans, you can use standard Eclipse, you can use IntelliJ IDEA, uh, and indeed you can use regular Notepad, you know, and those are all fine options. Um, but might we humbly recommend something a little bit better, actually quite a bit better? Uh, the Spring Source Tool Suite is the premier environment uh, for building Spring-based applications today. It is a Eclipse and Eclipse uh, distribution, um, but it's so much more. It, it's a an Eclipse distribution that tracks the latest and greatest uh, releases of the of the IDE, and it also includes uh, smart pre-configured plugins. Um, it's free, of course, so you can go to you can get it at springsource.com or slash developer or slash STS, and then download it. Let's take a look at that. I'm going to actually switch to my desktop now, and you'll see what I'm seeing, and hopefully you'll see Spring Source Tool Suite. So before I jump into that, as I said before, you can get the Spring Source Tool Suite by going to springsource.com forward slash developer forward slash STS. And there's lots of ad additional resources here where you can actually uh, uh, get you know the documentation and downloads and so on. But most interestingly is, is the actual tool suite itself. Go ahead and download it and have a go at it, and, and you can follow along with this webinar later on if you want, as because we, we're going to use it throughout the balance of this webinar. Okay, so let's switch to Spring Source Tool Suite. This is Spring Source Tool Suite. I've got my uh, I've got pre-configured projects and everything. So when you start it up, you won't see the same thing, of course. Uh, but it's it's an Eclipse distribution. It happens to have a lot of smarts with respect to Spring applications because it knows about those objects. It knows the metadata. It knows how to understand what's happening behind the scenes. Um, but it's also an incredibly valuable tool suite uh, on its own right, independent of the Spring support, right? Because it comes pre-configured with the latest and greatest uh, and stable and tested versions of the Git, plug you know, Git plugin, Subversion plugin, the Maven plugin, all sorts of other plugins. Uh, come prepackaged with it, and they're all tested and integrated against the latest and greatest Eclipse distribution, right? So I tend to use this, no matter what my use case is, I tend to use the Spring Source Tool Suite because it's just a very great way to start, you know, any kind of development experience. It saves you literally hours, you know. You don't have to spend any time downloading numerous plugins and testing and hoping that it works and so on. It just works. So when I start a new application, uh, I also start from Spring Source Tool Suite. Normally, I'll either click on this button here for a Spring template project, or uh, alternatively, if you don't have the dashboard open, you can go to File, New, and then click on Spring Template Project. 
you here you'll see a window that enumerates all sorts of great uh, pre sort of prepackaged, pre-configured, ready to run uh, template applications, things that you can use to bootstrap your development effort, right? Throughout the, the balance of the webinar, we'll use two projects that I created by simply using the simple Spring Utility project and one that I created by using the MVC project, right? So I'm not going to do that here, as I've already done it, and it would be redundant. But just so you know, most of the code that we see today was something I generated from here. We'll, we'll dissect the details, of course, and I'll make the code available, uh, available for download as well, but most of it was from here. Okay, cancel. When you run that wizard, you, you, it's like a wizard. You enter the uh, package name and the application name, and it produces a project for you. And it'll produce a project with a directory structure for your main code and your resources. And at the root of that project is a pom.xml file. pom.xml, for those of you who don't know, is the uh, Maven project object model uh, configuration file. It describes the uh, libraries that you expect to have on your on your uh, build path, right? It's a great way to de declaratively describe all that, and it's a great way to de declaratively describe uh, sort of the life cycle of the build itself. So this is a great example of where the Spring Source Tool Suite can help you, not just at the runtime and the API, API level as the Spring framework does, but it, you know, from inception all the way to deliverable build. You can manage the libraries yourself manually using the source code you view if you want, or of course you can uh, do it using the, the visual UI. You can see here that I've declared that I want a reference to the, I want the library, I want the jar on my build path for the Spring JDBC support. And I don't have to download it, I don't have to find it, it just comes down for me. And you can see it reflected here in the Maven dependencies, uh, you know, tree branch there. So it's already pre, it's already downloaded and everything for me. I don't have to manage the versions or anything. And indeed, if I check this project into my source control, I don't have to check in these jars because they can be reobtained. You know, so it's it's very easy to create light, clean projects. <laughs>